Hi everybody and welcome to our video about the four levels of explanations for healthy minds. Now this video is going to be a little bit longer than the last few because it is a really important concept within this topic. So as you may have noticed, a lot of the exam questions actually tie into this. So even though it might be asking you about the symptoms of anxiety, it's usually tying in the four levels as part of that as well. So we know the four levels by now. We've been doing them all year. Um, but for every topic that we've done, we've only focused on one level. And this topic actually brings all four together. So to briefly recap, we know that the biological level focuses on your brain structures, neurochemistry and your bodily systems. When we talk about mental illness, those are things like the, the bodily symptoms that are experienced by people with those illnesses. We can talk about the biogenic theory of mental illness, which is the idea that your biology um, and your genetics play an important role in my mental illness. This is particularly the case for something like schizophrenia, which we'll talk about. Um, and it's also the case for some substance abuse that can put you at a risk for developing some mental illnesses. Now, when we talk about the basic processes level, we always talk about cognitions, memory and learning. And when we talk about mental illness in particular, or healthy minds, we talk about impaired thinking patterns in people who experience mental illness. And we also talk about the fact that you can learn how to develop a healthy mind. You can learn coping strategies and you can learn ways to deal with or treat mental illness as well. Now, in terms of the person level, these are individual differences between every person. So particularly when we talk about mental illness, it's about age and also gender. Those are two really strong factors that can play a role. Age is particularly the case for schizophrenia. That's often um, diagnosed kind of late teens, early 20s. It's also the case for depression, found particularly in young people and quite old people as well. Doesn't mean that the, they're the only people, but that does play a role. Um, and unfortunately, females are more likely to be diagnosed with mental illness as well. So some of those factors play a role. And in terms of the sociocultural level, um, this is the idea that of, of sociogenic theory. So if we had biogenic he theory here, it's sociogenic, um, where it's your, I suppose, your society can actually impact um, who you are and your mental illness as well. So for example, those in society who have less power, minority groups, those who are um, living in poverty, they often have higher rates of mental illness. We also know that a sense of belonging, strong social support, they are protective factors. And on the other hand, isolation is a bit of a risk factor for mental illness. Interesting research has been done about technology. Now, social media and technology itself hasn't been found to cause mental illness, but there is a bit of a correlation with people who are already isolated using social media um, that can actually be an increased risk factor for mental illness. Interesting. So now we're going to go through for anxiety and depression and trying to break down some of the symptoms and the treatments that, that sit along each of the four levels. So when we look at anxiety, we know that some of the biological symptoms are things like headaches and trembling, the muscle tension, feeling dizzy, not being able to sleep. Lots more than that in our anxiety video, which you'll know about. In terms of genetic predisposition, there is a slight genetic predisposition, which we talked about as well. And we also know that the autonomic nervous system plays a role there. So we talk about in fight or flight, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system playing a role. Um, there are some biochemical disturbances, which is usually what medication tries to address, just like neurotransmitters in the brain. So if you're in that constant fight or flight, you're going to have increased um, hormones like... Um, adrenaline, um, noradrenaline, etc. So constantly in your brain. We also know that sleep and stress are impacted and that having a lack of sleep and increased stress can then um, be a risk factor for anxiety. Basic processes, we look at those thoughts. So things like catastrophizing, that's a very common um, negative thinking pattern, having fear, having worry, worrisome thoughts. Um, we know that classical conditioning can play a role. So particularly people with social phobia, they have learned to associate fear with particular stimuli. Um, and we mentioned catastrophizing as well. In terms of the person level, we know that females are at a higher risk of developing anxiety. In terms of personality, traits such as neuroticism, so we look at 
um, high neuroticism is things like worry um, and psychoticism. So people who are extremely withdrawn and hostile, um, those are associated with anxiety as well, as well as having a pessimistic outlook on life. From a sociocultural point of view, having environmental stresses plays a big role. So we've already gone through some life stresses and how they impact mental health and how they can be a, a risk factor. That's a role here as well for anxiety. Having a lack of general support around you, again, is a bit of a risk factor, just like having lots of support is a protective factor. And then we also talked about the role of technology here as well. When we look at treatments, when we look at the biological level, we talk about medication to try and address some of those biochemical disturbances, getting lots of sleep because we know how important that is, and also um, having some coping strategies for stress, so trying to address the stress hormones that are um, coursing through the body. Basic processes is all about um, learning, so things like cognitive therapy, cognitive behaviour therapy, learning to cope with and treat that illness. And also for phobias, we talk about systematic desensitisation. Okay. When we look at the person level, again, it's trying to address some of those person factors that um, add to or um, correlate with the anxiety, usually through CBT. And from a sociocultural uh, point of view, you can have things like group therapy, um, interpersonal therapy, working on having lots of support from family and friends to try and protect against the recurrence of mental illness. So that was anxiety. What about depression? So we know that a lot of the symptoms for depression are those that are here. So um, things that you might not know is that the brain structures actually alter in people with depression. So um, an example here is an, a slightly less active left frontal lobe of the brain. There's also the genetic factor and also the role of stress. If we look at the basic processes level, again, we have impaired thinking, concentration and decision making. There are some recurring thoughts of death or suicide, not in everybody with depression, but it can be. Having some depressive thinking styles like feeling worthless, having low self-esteem, self-value, those are all part of basic processes. And also a sense of um, learned helplessness can occur in people with depression as well, which we talked about in the learning topic. When we get to the person level, we're looking at trying to, um, or not trying to, we're looking at differences in personality. So people who are extroverted becoming highly introverted, you know, those, those personality changes can be a factor. Um, personality types, people who are indecisive, pessimistic, that can play a role as well. And also how you attribute things that happen to you. Are they because of your own making? Are they because of um, the world, things outside of your control? We often refer to that as the internal versus external locus of control. So whether you believe that you have autonomy over what you do or whether it's all outside of your control. Also, if we look at Isink's theory, again, people who are highly neurotic and psychotic, they are um, often associated with depressed people. So, sociocultural. So there are cultural differences that are reflected in depression as well, which we can talk a little bit about, and there's a lot of that in your textbook. Um, we often see a diminished involvement with not only activities, but also other people, which has a bit of a snowball effect because we know how much being with other people can help. So if they don't want to um, socialise with people, that feeds into itself. Um, living in poverty, having a really poor work-life balance, having really unhappy relationships or um, having a history of abuse, those can be factors here as well. Having really inappropriate or antisocial behaviour can have a role here. Um, and technology, so we already talked about that. If you're already isolated, you're at a greater risk of feeling even more isolated on social media. In terms of treatments, it's very similar to anxiety. So we look at drugs, just different kinds, which we talked about in the depression video, um, ECT and also exercise. Um, exercise is going to address some of the, the chemical imbalances as well. Basic processes, so learning more effective ways. So it could be coping strategies, it could be structured problem solving, it could be assertiveness training. They're all things that you can learn. Just like cognitive behaviour therapy, you're learning to change your thoughts and your behaviours as well. 
Meditation is also something that people can learn, which can also work at a biological level. Actually taking really deep, slow, measured breaths can assist with some of the symptoms, uh, particularly for people with anxiety. Person level here, so looking at assertiveness training. So assertiveness is a trait um, that you have, so trying to develop that a little more in depressed people. And from a sociocultural point of view, trying to buffer people against life stress um, by getting them involved with other people, support groups, and group therapy as well. So that was a lot of content in this video. The key takeaway is that learning these things, it's not necessarily something extra. It's about looking what we already know about um, protective factors and different types of disorders and being able to find the four levels and unpack that in a really logical way. So we'll have a look at some past exam questions in class, but you might like to go through your notes and start labeling. And there's also some great stuff in the textbook for you as well. All right, see you in class.